Hi everyone, I am Adolfo Neto, a professor at the Federal University of Technology Paraná, and this is the, this is the Professor Adolfo Neto podcast. In this podcast, I interview professionals from the field of computing and related areas. Areas today, I'm delighted to have Kiko Fernandes Reyes. I am not sure I'm, I'm saying your name right, but you can correct me later. On the show, Kiko is a computer science engineer and programming language researchers, researcher who works at Ericsson. He is a core member of the Erlang OTP team and co-chair of the Erlang Workshop 2024. Kiko, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having accepted my invitation. Uh, thank you for having me, Truly, really, Thank you. And how, how do you say your name? Uh, right. Uh, so my name is uh, Kiko. I, I think that was right. Uh, Fernandez Reyes. But I, I actually, Kiko is really the nickname. So the passport name is Francisco, but uh, no one really calls me that. Um, so Kiko is fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here, here in Brazil, there is a, a Kiko, although we write it in a different way, but he's very famous in Brazil. Uh, he's from Me Mexico, actually, from the, that Chavez. And even the name of the series is different, but in, in Brazil, the, if you say Kiko, people know, oh, it's Kiko from Chavez. But, okay, <laughs> let's... Do, do you know that TV series from Mexico? Chavez, Kiko? Yeah, it, it, I think I saw it when, when I was growing up a bit. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it's a classic. So, Kiko, let's get to know you a bit better. I see here that you have a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science from the Universidad de Málaga, Spain. What sparked your interest in computer science? What made you decide to, to follow that track? Um, I, th I think that's a bit tricky. In, in the beginning, it was just that I like to do a bit of programming before I started my bachelor and master because it was combined. Um, but initially, I really wanted to be a, a doctor. Um, and then uh, the grade was a bit too high for me to, to be able to pursue a career as a medical doctor. So then I thought, well, okay, the next thing that I want to do maybe is to work with computers. So then I, I got into the uh, computer science program, basically. Okay, and after that, you decide to pursue a PhD in computer science, focusing on programming language at Uppsala University in Sweden. And what motivated you to do that? And, and right, so at that, at that point, I had moved to Sweden. Um, and then in Sweden, I worked in industry for two or three years, I think. And I thought I was kind of repeating myself. So uh, maybe I'm doing some kind of web development using Python. And then uh, I was a consultant. So then you do it in Ruby on Rails. And then you do it in other programming language. And I thought I'm just repeating myself. So I want to be challenged a bit differently. And I saw that was a, a, there was an opportunity in this case to, to apply and, and try to see if I get the position as a PhD student. So that's what I did. Yeah. And what made you move to Sweden? Was it for personal reasons, reasons or professional reasons? I, I, I think that was a, a bit of both. So I think that was maybe around 2010, more or less. Uh, I had just finished my five-year uh, computer science degree. And in Spain, the situation was not really good. Uh, so at that point, my now wife uh, wanted to move to, to Sweden to study a master. And I thought, well, I have just finished. I have nothing really that makes me to be tied to Malaga. So why not? Let's, let's go and explore, basically. Let's go to Sweden. Why not? Oh, that, that's interesting. Because uh, right now I'm in the process of planning a sabbatical. And when I see Malaga, oh, I would love to live in Malaga because it's, it's hot. It has beaches, right? Yeah, I, it's completely south of Spain. Uh, I mean, nowadays I, I kind of see the benefit of being in Malaga, but, but now my life is in Sweden, so <laughs> it's a bit tricky to move back. Um, but definitely the weather is something that I really miss. Yeah. Okay, and then 
So you, at first you decide to get a job in industry and then you decided to do a PhD. A after we finished a PhD, I also have finished a PhD a few years ago. Here in Brazil, I didn't have much choice. I, I It was clear to me that I had to pursue a career in academia. But you had a choice and you decided to pursue a career, a career in industry. Why? And right. So to be honest, when I finished my PhD, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to continue in academia or go to industry. But I, I know that in, in Sweden, usually you cannot continue in the same university. So you need to move. And uh, I, 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 I didn't think that it was right for my wife and my son to say no, because I need to move. Everyone moves possibly to another country. So then th that was a bit out of the question. Uh, so then I started to look into companies that I thought I would have some kind of interest. And I really wanted to do functional programming. So I, I didn't want to look back and I didn't want to do object-oriented programming. And Klarna was doing Haskell. Uh, during my PhD, I wrote quite a bit of Haskell and then a bit of Erlang. Uh, so then I thought, well, why not? Let, let's try. Okay. And it because Klarna is kind of famous in the Erlang ecosystem community for being a, a, a big company that uses Erlang in production, right? So it was there that you got to know Erlang or it was it before? Uh, Erlang I didn't know uh, from my PhD days. So that was something that I learned a bit in Klarna. But at the same time, um, they were using Haskell and they didn't had that many people that came with a background you know, in Haskell and so on. So, so then I think possibly for them it was, well, Kiko already knows Haskell and Erlang doesn't have all the theory behind that you need to learn. So it's more pragmatic and I think that's a good thing as well. So then I, I, I think it was a win situation for them that I knew already both of them. Okay, now let's talk a bit about the Erlang workshop. So for the second consecutive, consecutive year, 2023-2024, you are co-chair. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if all my listeners know, but Erlang is a, a computer programming language that was created in the 80s, I believe. And it was created inside Ericsson which is where you work right now. But the Erlang workshop, workshop is more than that because it's related to all the, the Bing uh, community, the Erlang ecosystem community, which includes Elixir, was, which was created by a Brazilian, also Gleam, created by Louis Pilfold, and many other languages. And could you tell us a bit, but, but it, it's important to, it, it's that the Erlang workshop is an academic event. So maybe many people in the Erlang ecosystem foundation know CodeBeam, Elixir Conf, other conference, but they don't, they never heard about the Erlang workshop. What's the Erlang work, workshop? Right. So I, I would say it's like a forum that tries, tries to bring together um, people that do open source, academia and industry. And the community that we're kind of targeting in this case is uh, Erlang-like technologies. So this includes, of course, the Erlang language, but it also includes uh, Elixir, um, Gleam, uh, Lisp, Flavor Erlang. And I, I think we try to go even beyond just the Beam languages. So we want to focus also on concurrency, on distribution, right? And things that are possibly useful for our community. So I, I would say if if you do, for instance, Scala or Clojure, and you're going to use concurrency in some way in which Erlang has used it or could potentially use it or something, that would be a really interesting uh, topic to submit to the Erlang workshop as well. So we, we try to expand a bit more so that we can cover related technologies, basically. So the Erlang workshop, happens every year as part of a larger event, which is the International Conference on Functional Programming, right? And so uh, and if someone is watching this video or listening to this podcast episode 
after the the event you can wait for the next year it's going to happen again in a, usually in a different part of the world one year is in the usa other years in the europe in europe or even in a, uh, one country which is not one of those and i believe that in previous editions we've have we have had at least two papers co-written by developers i remember one by, by brujo benavides which is a erlang developer from argentina he wrote a paper with Laura Castro, which I interviewed here, and another by Juan Facojo. I'm not yeah. sure if, if Facojo is from Spain or Mexico, but he wrote a paper about closure, which is a, a version of closure for the for the Erlang for 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 the Bing. So it, it, it's interesting that it's, it's kind of. Uh, it's expected, but uh, developers can write papers too. And also there is a pos the possibility of presenting lightning talks at the Erlang workshop, right? Could you explain the difference between those two? Uh, right. So, I mean, for um, paper submission, we have two categories, uh, technical contributions, which could be um, a bit more research, I guess. Um, and the other track that we have is like practical, in a way, contributions, which could be m more about how you have used uh, Erlang, Elixir, or Gleam, or any other kind of technology uh, related to the um, Erlang workshop. What are the best practices that you did, uh, the design that you chose, and so on, right? So th those are, in a, in a way, the two kind of submissions. Usually, people from industry, go more into the practical side and because of that for instance last year um, we got a submission by EMQT um, developing an eventually consistent NISIA and also from the OTP team um, we got uh, submissions last year I think we got from Meta and some other two other co-authors that are, that are from different companies but I forgot them and the year before, as you said, it was Brujo Benavides and also Victoria uh, Francisco. Uh, the other year was Juan Facorro and Victoria again from Cisco and so on, right? So definitely developers can write papers. Um, if they're not used to writing an academic style, I would say you can just try to read one of the uh, Erlang workshop papers and take the style as you read it, right? So copy the style if you like it. And if not, you can always contact us. And maybe we can give you some, or put you in contact with some researchers that can give you early feedback on that, right? Now, the Lightning Talks are a bit different. Uh, the Lightning Talks are basically to explain a work in progress, if you are an academic, or to uh, go and present some kind of project that you've been working on, but it doesn't go through this kind of formal step of being, um, peer review and, and so on. So it's a bit different. Last year, for instance, we got um, an, someone from academia that got a paper published in ICFP and they wanted to show, in this case, the practical side. So then they provided, in this case, the lightning talk. And it was about uh, mailbox types. So something that I think they wanted to incorporate into Erlang. So th that was a really good one. Uh, there was another one, I think, about how to use how to use dialyzer, I think, in an Elixir project. So also a bit more practical as well. Right? So it's, it's a bit of a different kind of thing that, that you can submit as well. Yeah. OK, that's great. And now let's talk a little bit about the Erlang OTP core team. And I've got a few questions, so I will ask them one by one and maybe try to express what I think is part of the answer. So in, in my view, the Erlang OTP core team or the Erlang OTP team, to, to say in less words, is the group of people that is uh, whose respons they, they are responsible for getting the Bing, the, their Erlang virtual machine, better every and we, we've had we have had this in, in previous years for instance a few years ago there was the just in time 
compiler and so what exactly is the Erlang OTP team? Right, so the Erlang OTP team is the team that develops and maintains the Erlang programming language together with the OTP uh, libraries. So what you described, I think, would be more like the Erlang programming language, Beam, Virtual Machine, and so on, right? But there is also so much more than that. So we have plenty of libraries that are going to help you make your systems uh, fault tolerant, right? So uh, as an example of uh, OTP libraries, we have the SSL library, which nowadays is really TLS, but because of um, being backwards compatible, we didn't change the name. Or we have INET, uh, Minisia, right? real-time distributed database, uh, Dialyzer, if you want to check whether you have uh, errors in your program statically, uh, the public key, XML, so if you still work with XML. right? So it's a bit of not only the compiler or the virtual machine, but also the libraries that come together with the language. Oh, that's great. And um, you, uh, uh, the, the next question you, you already answered, what are the responsibilities responsibilities of this team? And I'm curious about the members. Or do, you, do you know, do, do you have a number, how many members have, are currently part of the core team? Yeah, I, I, I think it is not a secret that we're a small team. And by small, I mean between 50 to 20 people. Uh, it changes a bit. Um, but yeah, not that many, basically. And because in, in Elixir, I, I know that Elixir, it's probably the, the core team is probably even smaller, but I, I know that the, the Erlang core team, it, it has lots of responsibilities as you, you already mentioned, but do all people that are part of the Erlang core team, Erlang OTP core team, are, do they all work for Ericsson? Do you know that? Um, the, the people that develop and maintain the language, um, most of them, I, I, we, we have, I think, one or two cases uh, of external consultants. Um, and uh, they've been with us for many, many years. And it's, it's just working, basically. So then, uh, yeah, they, they continue, basically. And what can you say about your role within the OTP team? Oof, um, so I, I joined the OTP team two years ago, I think, more or less. Um, I start, uh, there are two teams in OTP, the protocols and the virtual machine. And you, you can see that in the tags that we place in, the, in GitHub. Um, I started in the protocols team uh, and I worked for them one year and a half or something. And then I started to transition a bit more into the virtual machine team because they're in charge of um, dialyzer and of things that I've done before during my uh, academia period, more compilers, type systems, and so on. So I think I can probably contribute a bit better um, to the virtual machine team. So I'm transitioning. And lately, I've been helping uh, Lucas Larson uh, with the migration of the documentation from XML, which is what we used to have, to uh, documentation attributes. And I mean, he, he's done most of the work, but I'm helping uh, in bits and pieces where, where I can, basically. Great. And in what ways can Bing developers, I mean, Elixir, Erlang, Gleam, contribute to and support the Erlang OTP team? Right. Um, there are many ways. For instance, the best thing you can do right now is to test the release candidates because we need to know that everything is working properly. Um, and we try to do our best, but sometimes we don't notice things. Uh, you can also help, for instance, by answering questions in forums, uh, Twitter, Slack, and so on. Uh, contribute with documentation or even guides. Also help third-party projects, right? Like River3, Erlang.mk, uh, uh, MK, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, Erlang LS and so on, right? And really, the important thing is not, for instance, to try to add a new feature or something like that, but everything else, right? If, if you fix an issue 
that already exists, you are not helping us, you are helping thousands of developers. If you contribute fixing the documentation, if we did a mistake, you are helping thousands of people to understand better the documentation, right? So it doesn't need to be just code or something really fancy or something. It, it can be just uh, fixing or even creating issues so that we are aware that there are issues that we need to fix. Okay, so many opportunities. And so I am Brazilian, I live in Brazil. Elixir was created by a Brazilian, José Valin. And so I'm curious to learn about your knowledge of Elixir. What's your familiarity with the language? To be honest, not much. Um, I can read some Elixir code. And for instance, for the EX talk, I've been looking at the source code because we have to do something similar. So I, I, I can read some Elixir code, but if you start doing macros, then I don't think I've read too many macros, for instance. So I, I can read functional programming style. Let's just say that, I think. Okay. And a final question that I, I ask everyone here, because we are in an area where we, we have to there, there, there is always always new things happening. For instance, in the the Erlang ecosystem, Glean is now a, a language that is getting some some traction. How do you stay updated with the news in your field? Do you prefer blogs, books, podcasts, YouTube, academic papers, courses? I, I would say a, a bit of everything. So on, on YouTube, I started to watch uh, your channel. And then regarding podcasts, I usually listen to Bean Radio, although I think it's usually more uh, Elixir focused. But still, I, I, I want to see what's going on basically with uh, Elixir as well. And then I try to read papers, right? Uh, like the Elixir type system, I have an interest in, in seeing how that is going to work out. So I, I read that. Uh, I also read the other set theoretic types for Erlang from Annette Vienusa and other people from uh, Germany. So that's another one that I, I thought it, it was quite interesting. And information here and there, basically. Yeah. There is a, a, an Erlang podcast, but it's right now it's on pause. It's called Hello Erlang. Yeah, I know. Okay which I do with my, my friend Slava from Ukraine and Brujo Benavides from Argentina, but who lives in Spain. And as you know, there's a war happening in Ukraine right now, so we are on pause, but maybe in a few months we'll be back. So thank you, Kiko, for sharing your experience and insights. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, no, just uh, if you have something to tell the Erlang, Erlang Elixir and Beam related language community, then submit something to the Erlang workshop and continue doing woodwork, creating issues, pull requests and so on. Uh, we're really grateful for all of that. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Kiko. And a big thank you to all our listeners for joining us today. We appreciate your time and attention. Until next time, goodbye. If you are curious and ready to take your Elixir language skills to the next level, check out my affiliate link to the ELX Pro course in the episode description.